really helps to hear and, and validate what the Lord is saying because, you know, we want to come up here and we, we, want to, we want to be excellent at what we do. We want this to be excellent, but what we value most is actually getting the heart of God and being transformed by, by what he says. And, and um, it, uh, the, the message was really about, you know, uh, that there were, and our small group message was about as well, that there were um, things and patterns in Scripture that, that were written there to help us figure out how to get the heart of God on something and how to get breakthroughs and, and how to have the hand of God on our life, that there are patterns in Scripture that help us with those kinds of things. And, and, uh, and, and then you, and you hear so many different opinions about the Bible and about denominations and the church is divided and all these mixed messages, and we lose sight of the fact that the Bible says that Jesus never changes. He is absolutely the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never change. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. He's the same. He's the same, same God of the Old Testament. is the same God of the New Testament. Amen. And so oftentimes, even in our, our teaching, sometimes we get, we get that messed up as if God got saved. He was a mean God, and now he's not a mean God anymore. He's a, he's a graceful God that loves us. But that's not the message. The message has always been the same, and that is, uh, I've got a success plan. <laughs> that's the message of God. I've got a success plan. Period. End of story. I've got a success plan. Say that. I've got a success plan for all creation, for everything. You know, so, 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 so to really get it to ring home about the truth of it, let's say it this way. I've got, a, I've got a failure plan, God says. I've got a plan to harm you and not to prosper you. I mean, I mean it, doesn't even, it, it doesn't line up with the character of God, does it? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit at all. I've got this failure plan for you. He doesn't. He has a success plan. And he wants you to align with it. And it's all in his word. And so in his word, he, he reminds us that I've got this message that flows all the way through the Bible. And, and what it does, it, it, it opens you up to who I am and what my success plan is. And so we need to know that Jesus' message never changes. And that message, that, that mission and that message has always been the same. And that message is not a boring message. That message is not a message that's out of date, that somehow as we become more educated and more knowledgeable, that somehow the message of Jesus becomes out of date. But it's a message of hope. It's a message of rescue. I want to rescue from a place of failure or, or discouragement or, or lack. And it's a message of love. It's a love message. How much I love you. You know, we know, we know that, 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 that as parents and as grandparents, we, we, we love our kids. I mean, we could even see love gone amiss. You know, we, we, I'm reading in the newspapers. Or, do they still make newspapers? <laughs> my newspaper just happens to be on my phone now. But you can tell my age because automatically I just said newspaper. But I, I read in the media... You know, about the, about the parents who, who uh, tried to get their kids into schools that they might not have deserved, you know? You know, we say, well, uh, we say a lot about those parents, you know, can you say that? Uh. But, you know, it was born out of love. They wanted the kids to fail. And they had this ideology about what success was, and they tried to help that along, right? It was wrong. It was illegal. But... You know, it, it, it was born amiss, but it was, it was born out of the place that I want good for my kids. And see, we got to understand that God is not going to do anything amiss. He's not going to do anything illegal. He's going to do things the way he designed them. But he's got plans for you to be successful. He doesn't want to see you fail. He doesn't have a failure plan for you. 
Somebody needs to get a hold of that. The only way that you could fail is if you do your plan instead of God. That's the only way that you can bring failure into the mix. And I'm reminded about this message and how it was established. You know, on the Sabbath, God says you need to have established, and I, I want to establish this thing, the Sabbath, so that you'll, you'll, you'll be brought back to a place of you understand that I've got this love for you that wants to bring success. That you, you constantly, we gather on Sunday morning, not so that we can have, have this, you know, excellent service and the church can raise money and we can have jobs. It's not why we do church. We do church to be reminded how much God loves us and how we can uh, be a part of his success plan. And without him, we can't be successful. And so he did that and he did communion. He established communion. He said, with communion, with the sacraments, I want you, when you take them, to remember that I love you. I love you so much I was willing to die for you, that I gave it all for you so that you could be successful, so I could rescue you and redeem you. I did all that. And his message has been that all along. If I look at Scripture, and I was reminded of that this week because my boy's in college. If y'all don't know, he's, he's about six hours away. And uh, he was having a little rough week. How many of you know in college? You know, all at the end of the semester. It's the end of the semester, right? And they pile it on. You got you to gotta get, get all this stuff done. You know, everything's due. We're closing it out, you know. And, and that stress. And there was a couple of his truck broke down, and he's six hours away, and you know, Daddy's trying to fix it over the phone, and, and, I, and, and I was just, I was trying to encourage him, and I started praying for him, <laughs> and the Lord brings this up, and he says, he says, send him the scripture. <clears throat> so, I sent him a scripture that says this, if you'll, if you'll write my word on your heart and be careful to do all that it says, you'll be like the man who built his house on the rock when the whew, sorry y'all when the wind comes the storm comes and blows against that house nothing it'll stand but if you're the person who hears my word and doesn't do it you'll be like the man who builds the house on the sand the wind comes the storm comes and and the house falls and great is the fall there's, there's this place of Jesus reminding us that we need to build our house on the Word. And it's not only knowing the Word, it's doing the Word. We say, well, that's a great message. It's in red. What a great New Testament message. And I was reminded again that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and ever, because, forever more because in Joshua chapter 1, you know what it says to Joshua. Now, this is the Joshua, you know, right after the Exodus. <laughs> I mean, this is like right in the beginning. Joshua, I want you to be courageous. Be strong and courageous. Make, make, make sure you know my word. Write it on the forefront of your head. Put it, make sure it's in your heart. Be careful to do all that it says. Not some of it. Make sure you do all that it says. And when you do that, you will make your way prosperous. You will have great success. So there's this message about Jesus that Jesus quotes in a different way that was talked about in Joshua because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And the message never changes. It never changes. We're to hear the word and we're to do it. We're to hear the word and to do it. And we need to know that the message that God loves us is still for today. It was the old message. He did love us. He still loves us. And he will love us even when we make mistakes. Even when we fail, he still loves you and me. He wants to reveal himself to us. He wants to bring revival to us. He wants to reveal his intentions. And his intentions, again, 
are success. They're not failure. Again, I want you to just think for a minute. If you're not familiar, there's a verse that says, I have plans for you. It's in Jeremiah. I have plans for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Can you imagine the Lord saying, I've got plans for you, plans to, for your failure, fa plans for your destruction? It, it, again, it just, it's not there. And, and he's saying, I've got all these things for you because I love you. I want to reveal my intentions. And so God's got a success plan. And the thing that we need to realize is that he established it in the beginning. And this plan is an ongoing plan. He knows the beginning, the middle, and the future of the plan. Our job is to join the plan. That's why he says you need to know what I say and you need to make sure that you do what I say because if you know what I say and you do what I say, you join the plan. It's that simple because I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it come about. Now, going back to Richard and when I was saying about getting his email and that encouragement, there are patterns and behaviors in Scripture that we can pull from that bring that bring about success. And there's a favorite passage of Scripture for me, one, one of them, that you've heard many, many, many times, and that is, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for a heart that is solely devoted to Him so that He can show Himself strong through that man and woman, so that He can carry out His purposes and then His plans. He's, he's looking for somebody that has a heart. And so if, if I understand that the pattern in Scripture that, that, that the thing that I can glean from the whole of Scripture is I've got to have a heart toward the Word and the way of God. And if I don't have a heart for the Word or the way of God and I don't be careful to do it, then I can't expect kingdom to come in my life. You see, I hear, I hear people all the time say, well, I'm just mad at God. Well, what you mad at God about? Well, you know, I, I did this and God didn't protect me. Or this stuff is happening in, in, in my life. And, I, and you just say, well, are you in the Word? No. Uh, what, are, are, you, are you doing the Word? Well, probably not. And we get mad at God because we're not doing the very thing that can actually bring kingdom. And it's really not God's fault. You see, God is saying... I love you. I want you to prosper. I've got plans for that. Come to me. Join me. You know, everywhere in Scripture, everywhere in Scripture we see that God is giving us an invitation to come and, and join Him. Come join me. There's a message of love. Let's look at what it says in John 3.16 that he, he, he wants to provide a way for you to succeed, and He already has. In John 3, 16, it says this. This is through 18. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. What's interesting to me is Jesus later on describes what eternal life is, and, and He says eternal life is to have an intimate relationship with the Father and the Son. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, so Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him, whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. And so what we need to understand and what is pictured throughout Scripture is Jesus has already done all that He's going to do. He's done everything that he, it, 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 it's possible to pour out His love at the cross so that you could be saved, rescued, and succeed. Now, success for a believer should be that we want and breathe and eat the Word of God and do it. That's really success. But God wants us to be successful in that way, and that is the very thing that brings success. But here, what he's saying is, Jesus doesn't condemn the world. Say that with me. Jesus doesn't condemn the world. Would you agree? Is that what he says? Who does? Who condemns the world? 
We do. Who condemns you? You do. I do. How? We don't believe. We don't believe. And he said, you don't believe? Please, son and daughter, believe. All I ask you to do is believe. Believe me. Hunger for me. Have a heart to know me. Have a heart for what I say. Have a heart for my success plan so that you can join it. Because if you don't believe, that will condemn you. And see, we don't, we don't get these things. We've got such a shiny, glitzy church. These days that we're missing the heart of God. The heart of God is chasing people that have a heart for Him. And His Word, He, he wants us to, to know that, that He loves us and wants us to succeed. So His mission has always been the same, and that is to rescue and restore us. He wants, you to, he wants to rescue you from your way of thinking. He wants to rescue you from your emotional turmoil. He wants to rescue you from any kind of thing that disagrees with Him, any way or form of thinking that disagrees with Him. He wants to rescue you from sickness and heal you. That's what He wants done. He says, I want to restore and rescue from the very beginning, even with Adam and Eve. That's what Jesus began to do is rescue and restore. And so how is that done? Well, we've heard the story over and over again, but we need to be reminded that it was at the cross where every bit of love that God had was poured out. The, 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 the amazing amount of love that God himself, the one who created the universe, would actually lay down his life for you and me because it, he loved us so much. It, he, it, doesn't say, it doesn't say anything that motivated God outside of love. He said, for God so loved the world. That he gave his son. Jesus came and his motivation was love. It was love. And then, and then he says, I love you so much, I want to live in you. I want to make, make you my home. I'm going to make you the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's whole job is to woo you to the truth. Is to constantly woo you back to God's successful plan, which is written in His Word. His successful plan is written in the Word. And so the Spirit calls and woos you, and His whole mission is to reveal the truth. So you can align with it. So as you align with it, and you agree with it, and you believe it, and then you actually start to do it, that has the ability... To bring success. In other words, we can't keep doing things that are contrary to the way God says do them and expect kingdom to come. And we can't keep getting mad at God because he's not protecting us in those things. Let me give you another story. It was a funny story. I kind of told it on Wednesday night. So if you're here Wednesday night, just bear with the preacher. I was uh, pulling this trailer, and we were pulling a lawnmower. Jo Joe Altamirano blessed me with his uh, one of his lawnmowers that that uh, that he'd been using, and and I was pulling it home, and I had it on that trailer, Joe, and and I looked back, and that the 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 bearing was bad on the trailer, and that thing had been wobbling, the tire had been wobbling going down the road, and the whole outside of that tire was just like, I mean, I could see the air inside the tire. It was so it was so bald. I mean, I'm like, oh my goodness, that tire is in trouble. And and I you know I I, I drive it home and I, and I get the tractor home and I drive it back to Michael's where I, where I keep the trailer and I, I get it there and I and I can remember going Phew, thank you Lord for 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 letting me get that tractor there and not because it was Wednesday night this was Wednesday and this was Wednesday night and and I had to get at church and I was on a time frame you ever been a time crunch you glad things go the way they, they're supposed to you know I was like, Phew, God thank you for that and and it was just as clear as day. The Lord says to me, you know, if you don't change that tire and fix that hub, it's going to go flat on you next time. If, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, it's going to go flat. 
we can't expect God to keep protecting us when we're not doing what needs to be done to actually keep things going rightly. And we can't keep getting mad or frustrated or disappointed with God when we're the only one who can actually bring in condemnation. We're the only ones who can bring it in. There's a, there's a story in, in, in Luke chapter 19. It's about Zacchaeus, and there's just one verse at the end of Zacchaeus when Jesus goes to the party place, he goes to the party house, has this big party. Zacchaeus gets saved, has a radical transformation, pays double back all the people he's ripped off. And Jesus says this about Zacchaeus, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. His whole mission was to come and seek and save that which was lost, which brings us to a place that we see and we sing the, the, the song, you know, um, there's 99 righteous and there were one sheep. You remember the song, Jesus came after, he, he'll go after the one. Y'all remember singing that here? Somebody do like this. Let me know you're all awake. Okay, good. So <clears throat> there's a, there's a, passage in scripture and we we think you know well, well god's gonna you know god's gonna go get the sheep the, the lost sheep and it's true he's already done it he's already done it let me read it and then i'll talk about it what man of you having a hundred sheep jesus says if he has lost one of them does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that's lost until he finds it and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep that was lost. Now when we think about Jesus coming to save that which was lost, he's already done everything he's going to do to save that thing that was lost. It's already been done. It is finished. He's done it. And so if he'd done it, the only thing that the Holy Spirit can do is woo you back to the place that it was done. Just woo you back to the place. Here's the cross. It was done right here. Now, I want you to see, I want you to see, Jesus says this in verse 7, just so I tell you, in other words, the same is true, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous. The sinner repents. The shepherd can, can go to the rescue, but in the kingdom, the sinner has to repent. The sinner has to turn back to God's way. It's, it's not enough just that the shepherd came. He's chasing the 99. He's chasing the one. He's already found the 99 because the Bible says nobody's righteous, no, not one. The only one that's righteous is Jesus. So if, if the righteous are righteous, the 99, then they're already in Christ. And so he's still after the one. But the one is already knows that he's in, in rescue mode. He's just got to respond. Hey, here I am. I'm over here. I'm coming. They got to respond. It says heaven rejoices when the one repents and comes back to the provision to the shepherd. Now, the reason I'm saying this is, is this might be you. You know, you might not have aligned yourself or believed in Jesus or the work of the cross, and you need to do that today. But oftentimes we pray for people and we pray for them wrongly. How we pray for them is we pray for them, Lord, go get Uncle Bill. Lord, go get Sue. Go get, you know, go get so-and-so. Lord, go get them. Lord, don't let them go to hell. Lord, don't do that. Well, the Lord's done everything he's going to do. Right? So our prayer is, Lord, may Uncle Bill have a soft heart. 
Lord, may Uncle Bill's eyes be open. Lord, may Uncle Bill hear the wooing of the Holy Spirit and respond to the love that was poured out on the cross. He's already done everything he's going to do. We have to respond to the love. And so the sinner repents. There's another parable. It's called the prodigal son. It's in Luke chapter 15 as well. If you want to go read these today, it would be a great way to spend your Sunday afternoon. Luke chapter 15. And th this is how we mess up because we love our kids so much we want to rescue them. We want to, we want to go get them. We want to, we, as parents, we want to, we want to enable them. <laughs> we want to keep them from having to go through the mess. But if you'll learn from the way the Lord parents, it'll help you. Because the father never goes to the pig pen in the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son is given everything he needs for success. And he wastes it on partying. He wastes everything that the Lord gave him on partying and he finds himself in a total place of lack where he's having to get the lowliest of jobs and feed the pigs where in Jewish culture they can't even eat a pig. So it's the lowest of lows. I mean, it's the worst. Of, and he finds himself eating the same thing the pigs are eating. And it says about the prodigal son, as the father is off at home, he came to his senses. He got in his right mind. And he said to himself, even the servants in my father's house have it better than this. I'm going to go ask my father for forgiveness. What do you call that? Repentance. The father didn't go to the pig pen. The son had to come out of the pig pen. And the father was there full on love. Restored him back to full. You, you got it all. You got everything that you've always had. I'm here. And he said he saw him coming in the distance. And the father runs to him. We need to understand that what Jesus is doing, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's already done it. It's already been done. It's already been written. It's already been revealed. It's, you have everything you need for life and godliness. You've got to read it. You've got to know it. And you've got to do it. And when you read it, know it, and do it, it'll make you successful. Because God has a success plan for your life. And it's called the Word of God. And, and you've got to have a heart to know the Word of God. Back to Richard. One of these, one, they went through, he sent me this thing that had a bunch of these, uh, you know, just talked about a bunch of prophets, but the one that stood out the most was Ezekiel. And, and, and Isaiah's another one. Jeremiah's another one. They did some weird stuff, y'all. They did some weird stuff because they had a heart to please God. They had a heart to know God. They had a heart to do the Word of God. And so, and so they responded in some weird ways. Ezekiel, Ezekiel laid on his side for 400 days, over 400 days. All right, Ezekiel, go back outside. Just lay there on your side. This time I want you to do this today. I want you to do this today. Got his instruction from God and did it for 400 days. Why? Because he had a heart for God. And he had a heart for the people to return to God. And when we as a people and a church, when the church of the United States of America will wake up and realize that it's not glitz and glamour and show that actually has the ability to bring things to Christ, it's actually a heart to please God, a heart for the Word of God, a heart to stand true and faithful to the things of God and align ourselves with His plan. When that happens, there's a possibility for success. Otherwise, there is no 
way to success. We usher in with disagreements and unbelief con condemnation. And then we get disappointed in God. And God has said, hey, I gave it all for you. I want you to be successful. Let me just tell you a couple more things. You know, it's interesting to me that in this whole, all these parable things, the disciple says, Jesus, why are you talking to us in parables? And it was really weird because there's a hard, there's something that's hard to understand. There's this thing that's really difficult for me to understand, and that is some people don't want to be rescued. Some people just don't want to be rescued. And you go, why don't you want to be rescued? Because they'd rather be in charge than be rescued. <clears throat> and God will not continually shield a person who lets hell keep having influence in his life, who keeps opening up things that are contrary to God, who keep testing hell's way instead of aligning with the word and the ways of God. And if you know anything about me, you know that when and it doesn't line up with the word, when it's not the character of, of the word or the attitude in which it was written, it, it really messes with me. And there's a scripture in Isaiah that really goes back to what we're talking about in the word and the way and how it brings success. And it starts with a, with a phrase that says, come now, let us reason together. And I've heard preachers preach this message that, you know, God's a reasonable God. You've heard me say, if you've been around here any length of time, God's a reasonable God. He says, come, let us reason together. Well, people, let me just tell you. I mean, when he says that, it's, it's not in this way, yeah, let me hear your opinion, and I'll tell you my opinion, and, you know, it's okay which one you choose, whichever, whichever way you want to go, you know, it's good with me. Well, you know, we can, we can agree to disagree. <laughs> it's, okay, it's just not like that. <laughs> he says, come on now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I shall make them white as snow. I love you so much. I'm going to take care of all your mess. And all this grime and dirt that are caused by bad decisions and any, any type of thing that doesn't align itself with my successful plan for your life. I've made a price. I've paid a price. I've rescued you. I've done everything. It's finished. I've loved you so much and I've loved you so well that none of that's going to be held against you. It would be it was like scarlet, but it's going to be white as snow. It's red like crimson, but it'll be white like wool. Verse 19. If, everybody say if. You are willing and obedient. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good. Verse 20, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. God, let us reason together. I mean, but how did the church get to the place where they feel like they can do anything they want and God's supposed to protect them? How did we get there? How did we get that we can do anything and reap kingdom? It's, it's just not in Scripture. Jesus said this, remember, he who hears these sayings of mine and is careful to do them is like the man who built his house on the rock. The winds will come. The waves will come. The rain will come. The storm will come. And it will beat on that house. And that house is going to stand. But if you rebel or refuse to believe, then it's like building your house on the sand. Waves are coming, wind's coming, storm's coming, and that house is going to fall, and great is its fall. Jesus is saying this. You do my word. That is what protects you. You rebel against me. You refuse to believe in me. And that opens it up for the wind and the waves to do destruction. Listen, 
There's nothing that can destroy you. You're indestructible. Physically, mentally, and emotionally. You're indestructible as long as you line up with the Word of God. As long as you're committed to the way. But the church needs to wake up and realize that we have to have a passion for the Word of God. We have to have a heart for the Word of God. we got to eat breathe the word of God we got to be like Ezekiel and lay on our side you know in our you know not not really but you know what I'm talking about we got to be willing to do what the Lord asks and all he's asking us is to know his word and to be careful that we do it and that's going to bring kingdom so this pastor says to the Lord today father open my eyes may May my hearing impairness wane. May my heart soften. May I, may I have a passion for your word like I've never had before. May, may I want to eat this more than I want to eat a meal. And, and, and may I be totally motivated by doing it. But there's no amount of money. There's no amount of fame. There's no amount of influence that could outweigh my desire to know your word and to do it. And when we get to that place, as a church, as the church in America, America has a chance again. And so it starts with us. And so this morning, I hope, and in the first service we said this, we want to understand the love, the breadth, and the width of the love of God. That he's got this success plan that he wants us to line up with. And the only way that hell can actually crumble us is if we refuse to agree with God's success plan. And I am determined, and I hope you are today, I'm agreeing with that success plan. Amen? Amen. 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 Why don't we stand for close? Well, we're not standing yet. we got to do something, don't we? And I'm seven minutes and 45, six, seven, eight, nine, no, seconds over. Do we have three more minutes for Cheryl? Four minutes for Cheryl? Okay.